Campfire Classics is a classic literature podcast. However, your hosts will occasionally use not-so-classy language and immature humor to describe very mature situations. As such, listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Ken Sandberg. And I'm Heather Michelle Lawler. Welcome to Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. It's the end of February, 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 and it will be March soon. Hello, March, March, March. I missed the song last week. Yep. That was nice. See, I, I felt like I let our uh, listeners down last week by not having a song prepared. So uh, not that I ever prepare anything for that moment. It kind of just comes out of me. <laughs> An eruption of, of of musical theater for you. <laughs> like diarrhea or yeah. vomit. I, or musical vomit is what <laughs> I do best. Yes. <laughs> Hello, all. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. 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 I assume I'm all. I assume when you say well, all, you're, you're talking the only to one me. that's going to talk directly back to me, <laughs> or things are going to get really weird in here. Yeah. Let me know if you start hearing other voices because. Yeah, I will definitely let you know that. That'd be that weird. Be I have upsetting. headphones on, so I can only hear what's coming out of my computer. Okay. Well, then if you start hearing voices, then you're picking up something. Well, probably the aliens that are flying around all over the country right now. That could be. Realistically, if I start hearing voices, it probably just means YouTube started playing. But That's true. That's true. <laughs> or it's YouTube or aliens. It's It can only be those two things, though. Definitely. That's, that's the only Hey, folks. Welcome to our new game show, YouTube or Aliens. <laughs> uh, what is infiltrating my headphones? <laughs> well, there's just been a lot of UFO sightings. So. Yeah. Like, that's been going on, and I find it fascinating. I mean, I've always known there are aliens out there, but, you know, some people are like, oh, my God, and I'm like, yeah, duh. <laughs> I mean, statistically, there's something out there. Now, whether the UFOs that are being cited are alien UFOs or yeah. just terrestrial things that can't be identified, yeah. hence unidentified flying mm -hmm. objects, that's that's a whole separate issue. But, that's a whole other thing, but it, it's been happening and, yeah. and, you know, super fun. Uh. <laughs> and it certainly le leads to a lot of um, interesting videos. Yes. Interesting YouTube. Interesting YouTube, interesting TikTok, which is kind of the YouTube of the new. <laughs> I believe you. I still use YouTube. I, I mean, I still use both. I now now use both um, for, you know, different, different kinds of uh, mind-numbing uh, entertainment. Yes. <laughs> Some's good, though. Like, now I'm on TikTok, so Ken and I have been doing this diet thing, which I think we've mentioned a couple times, which I'm technically at the end of, but we're kicking ass. I'm down 10 pounds. He down, like, 20 pounds. We, like, slaying. Close to 30 at this point. Almost 30 hey, at this counting. point. Um, if I lost 30 pounds, I'd look sick. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we've been doing this thing, and I've, I have uh, ended up on protein TikTok. <laughs> So now I get like all these like cool like bodybuilder, not bodybuilder people, but like fitness people who um, have taken popular items of food and like made them healthy or made them like in a healthier way. So instead of here's a bunch my of sour high cream, protein yeah. beer. Yeah. <laughs> That would be great. He says uh, as he drinks a Guinness. As you drink a Guinness. I'm drinking my LaCroix. Uh, I had plenty of uh, alcohol two nights ago while seeing my dear friend Jesse do his cabaret. Uh, <laughs> I had enough vodka for the week. So back to my <laughs> LaCroix. Um, but yeah, I've ended up on protein TikTok. So I've gotten some cool recipes. We're going to make protein bagels soon. That's exciting. You made some Reese's peanut butter cup protein yeah, bites. Yeah, those are tasty. Yeah. They're really good. Yeah. So, uh, TikTok is useful. It's mind-numbing and can also be educational, just like YouTube. <laughs> just like this podcast. Just like this podcast. Nice segue, Thank Ken. you. I'm, I'm pretty good at those when they pop up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, welcome to Campfire Classics, dear listener, where we up-talk our friends' productions across the country, mm -hmm. where we say good or bad things about TikTok, depending on the mood we're in, mm -hmm. and where we try to educate you while we numb your brain. <laughs> this, Isn't that what all podcasts should be? Probably. Entertain, entertaining br brain Ed numbing? Ed yeah. Educational brain numbing. Yeah. yeah. 
take your take your mind off of the troubles of today while informing you about something something else that yeah. you might find humorous or educational. Yeah. yeah. So this this is a literary comedy podcast where what we do is take short stories that we find in the public domain and we bring them to you dear listener. We read them out loud so that you don't have to and we make all of the stupid penis jokes that that it allows the t- Ten-year-old version of you would have made. Ten-year-old? I didn't even know what a penis was when I was ten. I, I gotta go like fourteen. All right, fine. <laughs> I was a late bloomer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wasn't making dick jokes until I was a teenager. It's, yeah, I was. Uh, it was like junior high. It, it was when I was introduced to Beavis and Butthead. Let's be real. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Which was strongly junior high. So yeah. I was like 12, 13. But yeah, so we we do that, but we ha- also have another segment that we begin with uh, as of a couple months ago that has people enjoying it. So we continue to do it until someone tells us to fuck off and no one's told us to fuck off yet. I get told to fuck off regularly, well, but this. nobody has complained but about not, this. Not for Clown <laughs> Corner though. So welcome to Clown Corner. <laughs> uh, so this week, uh, because I've picked the story, I am also doing Clown Corner. So Yay. I'm going to start with a fun fact, and then I'm going to go into uh, the rest of it, and it, you know, it all makes sense. So what is the difference between a clown and a jester, Ken? Um, a jester, I mean... It- <sighs> I'm I'm bouncing back and forth between trying to come up with the honest answer and trying to come up with a clever like joke answer. Well, but there, realistically, there is an I think, actual answer. Yeah, I think I think a uh, a jester is specifically hired by someone in authority to make fun of that authority figure. So, yes, close. So a clown makes fools of themselves. Whereas jesters make fools of the audience. Ah, all right. Great. So yes, yes. Uh Okay, yeah. so like Don Rickles was more of a jester yeah. than a clown. Yeah, so you think of like stand-up comedians. They A lot of them are more jesters because they like take situations or other humans and make fun of them. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I'm going to cover is because it is still a sort of clown. It's just a jester is a uh, very specific kind of clown. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, three of the most famous jesters throughout history. Okay. With some little fun facts. So the first one we're going to go. We're going to go way back to the 12th century. All right. So according to 12th century writings, Rayer, R A Y E R. Hmm was an ambitious young man who made himself useful to all the right people, Good especially job. the noblemen. So he was lowborn, but he was um, quite witty and he fucking used it. So Rayer was notorious for making fun of anyone who wasn't present in the conversation. So basically, he was he, just he a little He talked shit about people who weren't there. He was a little bitch. Yeah. Um, and that was delightful to everyone. Everyone thought it was freaking hilarious. So, a source for this scandalous gossip and whispers, he apparently performed his clerical duties because he was also a priest. Awesome. So, he was a gossiping priest. Sure. Clown, which is so funny to which me. Which is not what you want if you're Catholic because they hear everything. Yeah, I don't think he was Catholic. This is Church of England, <laughs> strong uh. Church of England. Um, he performed his clerical duties alongside being the jester for Henry I. So, it wasn't... Church, Church of England, because it, it doesn't, it's not going to exist for another exist in, seven yeah, Henrys. Yeah. So it was whatever the, the British, whatever the British were before, it wasn't Catholic. Yeah, okay, they, didn't, fair enough. they didn't like the Catholics, you know, whatever. Um, but he was very popular with the servants and the children, um, and he had a nickname uh, that was basically idiot. <laughs> like, It's spelled differently, but it's idiot. It's like idiot. (laughs) Uh, So he he did this throughout his life. People loved him. Uh, And then he made a career choice um, when he went on a pilgrimage to Rome. And then he so then he like saw uh, like the downtrodden and the sick and stuff. And he returned to London and found one of the oldest medical institutions that is still functioning today called St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Cool. Uh, and he wanted to create a safe haven for the feeble that were not uh, as fortunate as he was as a lowborn that was kind of 
taken up because of his his wit. Um, because of his wit, and well, because he's sort of working at the church. Yeah. So both things took him out of like the streets, but so he he uh, found this hospital and it continues to function today. So that is rare. Who is uh, the 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 first jester? And now we have we're going to travel all the way to Germany, and we're going to go to Pukio. <laughs> Pierkio is a legendary figure. Rufi. Oh. <laughs> Pierkio. Uh, he's from Heidelberg, Germany. I've actually been to Heidelberg. Um, uh, so I've probably seen, there's a statue of him there. I'm like, I've probably seen it, but I was a child uh, before I was doing dick jokes. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was brought. Which to- only matters if the statue has a huge dick. It might. I don't know. <laughs> you didn't look up pictures? I have a picture of him, oh, but yeah. I don't have a picture of the statue. Um, so he was brought to the royal court as a jester in the early 18th century and was a massive success. So he was originally from Italy. Hence the name that ends with an yeah, O. Pierchio. Yeah. So he was assigned, uh, not only was he assigned a jester to the, the establishment there, he was also assigned keeper of the tune. Now, the tune holds the record for being the largest wine barrel in the world. Ah, okay. I'm thinking keeper of the tune. That sounds like... A singer. That's Well, that sounds like there's a specific Doctor Who episode. Uh, it's it's during the, the Matt Smith tenure as okay. Doctor. And there's this, like, ancient space alien demon thing who is kept asleep by a song. And the song oh. is continually sung. It can never stop. It can never. Or they the have to keep singing up. or yeah. the beast wakes up. Well, it's like the and three so le- three-headed dog in Harry Potter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Same idea. Um, Keeper of the tune. Sounds like a, yeah. Yeah. No. Sci-fi fantasy kind of title. No, it's just a fucking huge barrel of wine. So uh, it holds more than 2,200,000. 000- Thousand liters or fifty-eight thousand gallons. The jester was always in charge of the tune. This is, and he began this tradition. Thank you. Although it is sadly empty, it was originally meant for collecting wine given as tax payments. Huh. So it's like the worst barrel of jungle juice you've ever had. If it yeah. had, if it had stuff in it. Now, why Perkio was put in charge of this and why this continued? What, he was supposedly capable, and he's uh, he was also a dwarf. I don't know if you caught that. Yes. So, um, he was supposedly capable of drinking obscene amount of wine, like obscene amounts, um, and that's all he ever drank. And he like was like, no, all I drink is wine. He was nearly eighty when he fell sick, and he was persuaded by doctors to drink a glass of water, and he died that night. <laughs> <laughs> As the legend goes. <laughs> so the story, so he's Tyrion Lannister. It, he is Tyrion Lannister. I was like, I was going to like look, do a little more research and see if this was uh, part of uh, the research done by uh, um, the writer of Lord of the... George R. R. Martin. George R. R. Martin. Thank you. I was like going, I was like, not Lord of the Rings. That's Tolkien. Let's go help, help, help. Okay. So then our third one I enjoy because fast forward to Henry VIII. <laughs> I'm Henry VIII, I am. Henry VIII. So we have our first female jester. All right. This is Jane the Fool. So Jane was once the fool of Anne Boleyn, mm-hmm. Princess Mary, okay. and the survivor, if you've watched six, Catherine Parr. Jane the Fool is featured in the only surviving family portrait of Henry VIII's court. And you can see it right here. That's hanging her. out in the doorway, Just creeping in the out background. In the doorway. Um, so, which that painting was considered Henry's ideal family. So she was considered like part of the, part family. Of the family. But little is known about her. So court records show that Jane received a huge amount of support from the court, including the provisions of Valentine's Day gifts for her suitors, <laughs> as well as food and a caretaker for her horse. Every six months, she was given 12 pairs of shoes. Fuck yeah. Her head was also shaved every few weeks. And the like, no one really knows why, but presumably it was to set her apart from the other court ladies and also to make her more like androgynous because she was kind of doing a role that's typically a male. Right. Um, so 
her innocent nature. Uh, so Mary, um, Princess Mary, mm-hmm. one of the children, um, I believe was Prince. Princess Mary was which one's daughter? I can't remember. But, you know, he had lots of wives. <laughs> Somebody tell me who loves six because I'm sure it's brought up. I know it's not the one that died because she had a son <laughs> and she was he, she had the only son. I can look it up. Yeah, look it up real quick. Princess Mary. Oh, that's Queen Mary. Yeah. 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 Okay. Who became Queen Mary. Yeah. Yes. Catherine of Aragon. Okay. There it is. That's his first wife. So that makes sense. Um, so young Mary was um, notoriously innocent. And that meant Jane probably served as a practical joker, like telling riddles and reciting ballads. And based on letters from Catherine of Aragon, Jane was also there to help improve the girl's health by using laughter as medicine. Aww. So. That is our gesture story, our clown corner. And I also love that, like, the f- last little fun fact about her is laughter is the best medicine. And that's what we aim to do here yeah. on Campfire Classics. You know who else would agree with that? Danny Kay. Oh, uh, and who played the court jester. I know. I was, yep. I thought about throwing that in there and then, like, so I figure down the road I'll do, so, like, famous uh, fictional gestures. So we'll be watching that movie this week. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> I've been trying to get you to see that movie for ages. And I've never said I wouldn't want to yep. see it. Yeah. Uh, just, we'll we'll you know. be watching that movie this week. Cool. Well, that is Clown slash Jester Corner. That is that is Laughter Corner. <laughs> <laughs> that is Giggle Corner. Uh, Red Nose Roundabout. Red Nose Roundabout. <laughs> um, I like that. Uh, big Shoe Bend in the Road. Honka <laughs> uh, Honka Horn Corner. I don't know. No, that just oh, sounds like a boob thing. Isn't it? I suppose isn't for the sake of alliteration, it'd be honka honka hangout. Honka honka hangout? I like that. Because clowns usually have horns. They're like honka honka. But, you know, that's also the noise people yep. make when they grab honka, your Honka honka. Honka honka. Yes, I was just doing it. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> For those of you at home, because we're in a freaking studio and this is not videotaped, honka honka. Okay. (laughs) So now on to what we actually do. Here is some fun facts about our author this week. Because Uh, oh yeah, because yeah yeah, that thing. Because uh, Heather picked a story for me to read this week, so I'm going to do that in a couple of minutes, but first she's going to give us some background. First I'm going to give you some fun facts, Um, more fun facts, because Heather loves fun facts. All right, we have a new author this week, and as I was telling Ken as I was setting up here, um, I went... I'm pretty sure this story is available to the public for, like, consumption. Um, I could not find anything, and there were tons of PDFs all over the internet, which yeah, is not... Yeah, it doesn't not, mean anything, but... Huh? <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean I anything. I know, it doesn't, but, like, there, I have definitely, like, looked for stories that are not in... That are definitely not in the public domain, and you cannot find them, like, yeah. th- without paying for them. If you own the rights to this story, please email us so that we can tell you to fuck off. <laughs> Please don't sue us because we don't make very much money. Um, and we'll just, you know, take the episode down. Minus or, clown corner honka honka. Or go ahead and sue us for the entire value of the podcast, which is n- n- nothing. And, <laughs> $200 a and, month. And then we'll go ahead and get a little bit of news off of the... Um, uh, off of the lawsuit. Yeah, if this writer sues us, we're going to get we're going to get some we're going to get some uh some yay. So let's go into it. So we have a new author and he is from Japan, so I hope I pronounce his name right. All right. Haruki Murakama is Great. his name. He was born January 12th, 1949. Okay. So Murakama, or Murakami, sorry, Murakami, is that what I said? Haruki Murakami? Yeah, Murakami. Murakami was born in Kyoto, Japan during the post-World War II baby boom, which we also had here. Yep. That was a worldwide baby boom, um, and was raised in a few different towns in Japan. He, he was an only child. His father was the son of a Buddhist priest, and his mother is the daughter of an Osaka merchant but both taught Japanese literature. So he was definitely raised in a literary household. Cool. So since childhood, Murakami um, had been heavily influenced by Western culture, which was quite common after World War II. Um, sure. Just because, like, communication started to speed up because of, like, 
what was going on during the war. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. there were now um, people crossing borders more. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you also were just seeing a huge advance in technology. Well, like, and television. Yeah, like, it was it was becoming yeah, much easier much to easier. yeah. Um, radio was vi- like everyone had a radio at this point. So, um, and because he was brought up by literary teachers. Um, he was exposed to these people. So he, he grew up reading a wide range of works um, by European and American writers, including Franz Kafka, Charles Dickens, Kurt Vonnegut, Jesus. Dostoevsky, and uh, Jack Kerouac. Great. So all the happy ones. All the happy ones. <laughs> Let's be fair. The like 50s, six, like the, and he also like, they're close to Russia. So he was raised on like a lot of Russian music and literature. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> At least, at least he kind of, you know, Charles Dickens had some joy. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Western influences distinguished him from a lot of other Japanese writers because he really embraced it. So he studied drama at Waseda University in Tokyo, and this is where he met his wife, Yoko, not the one you think. Um, and so they got married and they decided not to have children. And they opened a record store together. <laughs> cool. And then shortly before finishing his studies, they opened a coffee shop slash jazz bar together called oh, yeah. Peter Cat. <laughs> like Peter the name and cat um, in a neighborhood in Tokyo. Nice. And he ran this with his wife from 1974 to 1981. Cool. So... He did not write his first fiction, because remember, he studied drama, not writing. Right. He did not write his first story until 1978 when he was almost 30 years old. Okay. He said, quote, before that, I didn't write anything. I was just one of those ordinary people. I was running a jazz club, and I didn't create anything at all. (laughs) Yeah, you know, running a jazz club like an ordinary person. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, yeah, he's like, I had a business, and I kind of did my thing. He was inspired to write his first novel called Hear the Wind Sing, of course translated, um, while watching a baseball game. (laughs) Sure. As you do. He says he described this moment. He realized he could write as a warm sensation as he could feel in his heart. So he was really enjoying the baseball game, and he wanted to write something down that was so joyful as he was feeling at that moment. So he worked on Hear the Wind Sing for 10 months in very brief sketches and at night, you know, after he worked at the bar and all this stuff, completed the novel, sent it to the only literary contest that would accept a work of that length, and he won first prize. Nice. All right. So he's like, ooh, I kind of like this writing thing. Well, and that makes sense. He came from a... Uh, literary background. Uh, well, a literary background with his parents, and he, he studied drama, so he knows how, like, a compelling yeah. story is told. Yes, yes. And a lot of his works actually have been, well, like, two of his works specifically have been um, adapted and translated um, for Steppenwolf oh, in Chicago. cool. Yeah, I don't go into all that because, I mean, he, like, clearly he's still alive, so he, like, I mean, there's he's still writing. <laughs> so, Sweet. Um, but yeah, Steppenwolf definitely um, in the past like 10 years has adapted two of his pieces and he has helped. So very much still in the drama world. Uh, in 1985, Murakami wrote Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World, which was a dreamlike fantasy that took magical elements um, to a new extreme. So he started like diving into like the fantasy thing. Mm-hmm. Um, His first major breakthrough and for national recognition was in 1987 with the publication of his novel Norwegian Wood, which I have actually heard of. Oh, cool. I only know the song. Which maybe it's like that's where he got the inspiration because, yeah, I know the Mm -hmm. song, too. Maybe I'm thinking of the song, I guess. Um, But it's a nostalgic story about loss and sexuality. But it sold millions of copies to the young Japanese like population. Cool. It propelled him from being barely known into the spotlight like overnight. Like it was one of those things. He was mobbed at airports and other places because he just became all of a sudden he was like the it writer. Um, And so he was like, whoa. So they closed their jazz club. And started traveling. He's like, I think it's time to get out of Japan because now I'm like a celebrity and it's a little much. And, and I like that's to- why nobody plays jazz anymore. Because <laughs> it was all him. It was, yep. yep. It was him and his wife and they were like, nope, no more. 
Yoko breaks up another music group. God, God damn, damn it, it Yoko. <laughs> Uh, any Yoko connected to Norwegian wood just ruins music. Right? That's, that. <laughs> so he traveled through Europe. He lived in the United States. Um, he currently has an office in Tokyo, but he's very much all over the place. He was a writing fellow at Princeton, um, at Tufts University, and at Harvard um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So all right. he's doing okay. Cool. English translations of many of his short stories uh, between 1983 and 1990 have been collected into what is called The Elephant Vanishes. Spoilers, our story will come from that collection of short stories. Okay. Mirakami wa- has also translated many works of F. Scott Fitzgerald, Truman Capote, John Irving, and Paul Thoreau into Japanese. Okay. So he's taken a lot of like famous works and made them more um, accessible to the, his... like origin country sure translation um that kind of translation work is is something that i feel like a lot of people don't realize how much art goes into that yeah. because it's not as simple as just plugging the thing into google translate and hoping it'll work no because if you've ever plugged anything into google translate it yeah. doesn't really make sense first of all it's really strange there's oh i love the game where you you write out a paragraph Put it into Google Translate, translate it into like... Oh, like 12 um, languages, lost in translation? Well, translate it into like Portuguese and then from Portuguese to Japanese and then from Japanese back to English. Yeah. And, you're like, and then you try to read it back and it just doesn't yeah. make no. sense. Um, and that's why like when you've got someone who's good at doing that kind of translation, it like it, it makes it... It makes a difference. Yeah. Well, and this is another thing I did not necessarily put in here because, again, he had a lot of stuff. But um, when I was reading up and doing this research, um, when pe- when Americans or when English speaking people translate his novels, mm-hmm. he says, please be artistic with it. He doesn't want them to try and like word for word, blah, blah, blah. They want it to make sense and to be like to be fluid. Like, don't change the story, of right. course. But like he wants it to sound as beautiful as possible. And when he passes his work on, he trusts the person doing the yeah. translation. And that makes so. sense because the, the, I mean the, the syntax, the grammar rules of yeah. Japanese are, are so different, completely different yeah. from, yeah. well, it's a, from any like Western much language, older language and like, yeah. And they have very different, um, very, very different phrasing and whatnot. So his novels, essays, and short stories uh, have been bestsellers in Japan and internationally. His work has been translated into 50 languages and has sold millions of copies millions of copies outside of Japan. Received numerous awards for his work, including the Gunzo Prize for New Writers, the World Fantasy Award, the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, the Franz Kafka Prize, the, the Jerusalem Prize, and in April of 2015, he was named one of Time's Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. And in November of 2016, he was awarded the Hans Christian Andersen Literature Award. (laughs) In recent years, it has been mentioned that he is possibly a... um, going to come up as a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Cool. Um, but the nominations are sealed for 50 years. <laughs> so, like, there's no way to actually see if that's true, but it's, right. it's speculation. And when he was asked about this possibility, this is what he said. He laughed and said, oh, I don't want that prize. That means you're finished. <laughs> 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 so... He has a he has a great sense of humor and like he is um, very 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 famous and this it's like those people who don't want to get the um you never the, want to get the, the lifetime, lifetime achievement, achievement award because you're like wait whoa what the fuck man I'm only like sixty <laughs> I've got a lot of shit to do damn <laughs> rough man so the story you will be reading today <clears throat> is called the second bakery attack. It is a short story originally published in August 1985 in an issue of Marie Claire, Japan. (laughs) It is a sequel, though I've heard you do not have to read the first one, to a story called The Bakery Attack, which was first published in 1981. In 1986, The Second Bakery Attack was included in a short story collection of the same name. The story was later translated into English by J. Rubin, which is the one we'll be reading, and published in the January 1992 issue of Playboy. <laughs> 
1993, Rubin's translation was included in a collection of The Elephant Vanishes, which is that short story collection that has gone very um, famous for him. It's a bunch of his short stories. All right. So today you will be reading The Second Bakery Attack. There is also a film with Kirsten Dunst in it. So, uh, (laughs) hey, listener, just so you know, if this story is confusing and hard to follow, it's because this is a sequel and it's not my (laughs) fault. It's definitely not because I did a shitty job of reading it. Nope. You don't need to read the first one is what I've been told because there is an entire movie of just the second one with Kirsten Dunst in it if you want to go check it out. (laughs) All right. Let's start this fire. Wee! Start the fire for the bakery. (laughs) The Second Bakery Attack by Haruki Murakami. Translated by Jay Rubin. I'm still not sure I made the right choice when I told my wife about the bakery attack, but then it might not have been a question of right and wrong, which is to say that wrong choices can produce right results and vice versa. Ooh, philosophical. (laughs) I myself have adopted the position that, in fact, we never choose anything at all. Things happen... Or not. Damn, that's some deep philosophy <laughs> in the first paragraph of this funny story. <laughs> if you I, look I, at the- I guess I assume it's funny because it's called the bakery attack. I don't know. Uh-huh. It just sounds like it's going to be funny. Could be horrifying. This Maybe they be, just bomb the shit out of it and everybody dies. This fucking terrible, yeah. <laughs> if you look at it this way, it just so happens that I told my wife about the bakery attack. I hadn't been planning to bring it up, I'd forgotten all about it, but it wasn't one of those now-that-you-mention-it kind of things, either. What reminded me of the bakery attack was an unbearable hunger. Oh, it yeah. It hit just before 2 o'clock in the morning. We had eaten a light supper at 6, crawled into bed at 9.30, and gone to sleep. Well, first of all, that's your main mistake. You got into bed way too early. <laughs> Hey, maybe maybe this maybe, guy has to wake up at like, like three four in the, in the morning, morning yeah. to trade on the international yeah. stock markets or something. Perhaps, perhaps. For some reason, we woke up at exactly the same moment. A few minutes later, the pang struck with the force of the tornado in The Wizard of Oz. These were tremendous, overpowering hunger pangs. That was like me yesterday waiting for five guys. <laughs> Our refrigerator contained not a single item that could be technically categorized as food. (laughs) We had a bottle of French dressing, six cans of beer, two shriveled onions, a stick of butter, and a box of refrigerator deodorizer. (laughs) With only two weeks of married life behind us, we had yet to establish a precise conjugal understanding with regard to the rules of dietary behavior, let alone anything else. (laughs) All right. So we got newlyweds who don't quite understand each other's habits yet. (laughs) I had a job in a law firm at the time and she was doing secretarial work at a design school. I was either 28 or 29. Why can't I remember the exact year we were married? (laughs) She was two years and eight months younger. Groceries were the last things on our minds. They were just fucking all the time. They were like, sex, sexy, sex, sex, naked, naked time. That's why they went to bed at 930. Yeah. (laughs) We both felt too hungry to go back to sleep, but it hurt to just lie there. (laughs) On the other hand, we were also too hungry to do anything useful. We got out of bed and drifted to the kitchen, ending up across the table from each other. What could have caused such violent hunger pangs? We took turns opening the refrigerator door and hoping, but no matter how many times we looked inside, the contents never changed. Beer and onions and butter and dressing and deodorizer. I mean, I'd drink one of the beers. That would fill me up, at least temporarily. (laughs) It might have been possible to saute the onions in the butter, but there was no chance those two shriveled onions could fill our empty stomachs. Onions are... Meant to be eaten with other things. They are not the kind of food you use to satisfy any appetite. Unless you're at Sizzler and they have a blooming onion. And then it's like, fuck, you dip that in the French dressing. It's like, ah. Sizzler. 
Or huh. so, well, I guess what's I the other I think of that one? as the, the Bloomin' Onion is the Outback Steakhouse Oh, see, thing. I don't know. They're all the same to me. Sizzler, Outback, uh, Texas Roadhouse, you know. Those steakhouses, quote, quote unquote, steakhouses. Yeah, but you need like breadcrumbs and whatnot to get the bloomin' onion. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, I onions. I want a bloomin' onion. <laughs> we can try one in our new air fryer. Yeah. <laughs> like, it won't be the same. <laughs> Would Madam care for some French dressing sautéed in deodorizer? <laughs> I expected her to ignore my attempted humor, and she did. (laughs) Let's get in the car and look for an all-night restaurant, I said. There must be one on the highway. She rejected that suggestion. We can't. You're not supposed to go out to eat after midnight. She was old-fashioned that way. Well, she better get over her shit. (laughs) I breathed once and said, I guess not. That must be a Japanese thing. Breathing once? No. <laughs> Not eating out, out after midnight. No, no that's, that's actually very much uh, a, a sort of in the, the common, in the zeitgeist ideology. You don't really? eat out after midnight. There's a lot of like, you, should never, you shouldn't eat after 8 o'clock at night. What? <laughs> I, I went to Waffle House at ungodly times in the morning. I was at a deli in New York walking around in heels at like 6.30 in the morning the other day. Sure, there is a difference between a deli and going out to eat. Well, there's no diners open anymore. I would have stopped and gotten some disco fries. Also, it's the 80s. Cocaine. I don't know. (laughs) What did they eat in the 80s? Cocaine. Yeah, Yeah, that's it. Everybody was just eating. Cocaine and pizza. Everybody was just eating cocaine. Pizza. Cocaine sprinkled on pizza. Whenever my wife expressed such an opinion or thesis back then, it reverberated in my ears with the authority of a revelation. Maybe that's what happens with newlyweds. I don't know. But when she said this to me, I began to think that this was a special hunger, not one that could be satisfied through the mere expedient of taking it to an all-night restaurant on the highway, a special kind of hunger. And what might that be? I can present it here in the form of a cinematic image. Oh, thank God, because we're reading it, so now we get to see it. (laughs) One, I am in a little boat floating on a quiet sea. Two, I look down, and in the water I see the peak of a volcano thrusting up from the ocean floor. Three, the peak seems pretty close to the water's surface, but just how close I cannot tell. Four, this is because the hypertransparency of the water interferes with the perception of distance. (laughs) This is a fairly accurate description of the image that arose in my mind during the two or three seconds between the time my wife said she refused to go to an all-night restaurant and I agreed with my I guess not. (laughs) Not being Sigmund Freud, I was, of course, unable to analyze with any precision what this image signified, but I knew intuitively that it was a revelation, which is why the almost grotesque intensity of my hunger notwithstanding, I all but automatically agreed with her thesis, or declaration. You know, I'm not going to lie, that sounded pretty sexual. <laughs> There's an erupting volcano just below the surface. Yeah, and it very well could be. They are newlyweds. We don't know where this is going He's yet. He's just really hungry. Maybe the attack at the bakery is a euphemism. Hey, munching on buns. <laughs> we didn't Let eat- me see your croissant. <laughs> Let me get my eclair out and I will uh, pump you full of. (laughs) I'm done for now. No, that was two. You have to do a third. I did three. I said, get your buns out. And then I said, show me your croissant. And then I said, the eclair pump full of cream. Fair enough. All right. (laughs) The buns one was very, like, sly. Yep. We did the only thing we could do opened the beer. Fuck yeah! These are my people. (laughs) It was a lot better than eating those onions. Mm -hmm. She didn't like beer much, so we divided the cans. Two for her, four for me. (laughs) 
Now they're just going to get drunk. While I was drinking the first one, she searched the kitchen shelves like a squirrel in November. <laughs> Eventually, she turned up a package that had four butter cookies in the bottom. They were leftovers, soft and soggy, but we each ate two, savoring every crumb. Mmm, soggy cookie. It was no use. Upon this hunger of ours, as vast and boundless as the Sinai Peninsula, the butter cookies and beer left not a trace. Time oozed through the dark like the lead weight in a fish's gut. I read the print on the aluminum beer cans. I stared at my watch. I looked at the refrigerator door. I turned the pages of yesterday's paper. I used the edge of a postcard to scrape together the cookie crumbs on the tabletop. (laughs) I've never been this hungry in my whole life, she said. I wonder if it has anything to do with being married. Oh, no. (laughs) Maybe, I said. Or maybe not. He's very wise, this one. (laughs) (laughs) Is he wise or is he just indecisive? He's he's just trying not to ruffle anybody's feathers. Yeah. I think he's scared of her right now because, you know, I'm going to tell you, hangry is a scary thing on some people. While she hunted for more fragments of food, I leaned over the edge of my boat and looked down at the peak of the underwater volcano. The clarity of the ocean water all around the boat gave me an unsettled feeling as if the hollow had opened somewhere behind my solar plexus, a hermetically sealed cavern that had neither entrance nor exit. Something about this weird sense of absence, this sense of the existential reality of non-existence, resembled the paralyzing fear you might feel when you climb to the very top of a high steeple. This connection between hunger and acrophobia was a new discovery to me. Which is when it occurred to me that I had once before had this same experience. My stomach had been just as empty then. When? Oh, sure, that was the time of the bakery attack, I heard myself saying. The bakery attack? What are you talking about? And so it started. Oh, shit! He's so hungry, he just released a secret. (laughs) I once attacked a bakery. Long time ago. Not a big bakery, not famous. The bread was nothing special. Not bad, either. One of those ordinary little neighborhood bakeries right in the middle of a block of shops. Some old guy ran it who did everything himself, baked in the morning, and when he sold out, he closed up for the day. If you were going to attack a bakery, why that one? Well, there was no point in attacking a big bakery. All we wanted was bread, not money. We were attackers, not robbers. Yes, please understand the distinction. We just wanted (laughs) fucking food. We didn't want money. I've seen Les Mis. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And Aladdin. Yeah, so you're going to get in trouble either way. Mm -hmm. Just want bread. All this trouble over a loaf of bread. Oh, I want bread. I love bread. (laughs) We? Who's we? Oh, my best friend back then, 10 years ago. We were so broke, we couldn't buy toothpaste. Never had enough food. We did some pretty awful things to get our hands on food. The bakery attack was one. I don't get it, she looked hard at me. Her eyes could have been searching for a faded star in the morning sky. Why didn't you get a job? You could have worked after school. That would have been easier than attacking bakeries. We didn't want to work. We were absolutely <laughs> clear on that. Like, bitch, please. I am. I was 20 and I wanted to smoke weed and steal bread. <laughs> well, you're working now, aren't you? I nodded and sucked some more beer. <laughs> then I rubbed my eyes. A kind of beery mud had oozed into my brain and was struggling with my hunger pangs. Times change. People change, I said. Let's go back to bed. We've got to get up early. I'm not sleepy. I want you to tell me about the bakery attack. (laughs) There's nothing to tell. No action. No excitement. Was it a success? I gave up on sleep and ripped open another beer. Once she gets interested in a story, she has to hear it all the way through. That's just the way she is. Well, it was kind of a success. And kind of... Not. 
We got what we wanted, but as a holdup, it didn't work. The baker gave us the bread before we could take it from him. <laughs> Free? Not exactly. No, that's the hard part. I shook my head. The baker was a classical music freak, and when we got there, he was listening to an album of Wagner overtures. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Why? So he made us a deal. If we would listen to the record all the way through, we could take as much bread as we liked. I talked it over with my buddy, and we figured, okay, wouldn't be work in the purest sense of the word, and it wouldn't hurt anybody. So we put our knives back in our bag, pulled in a couple of chairs, and listened to the overtures of Tannhauser and the Flying Dutchman. I mean, that is that is a lot. I mean, it's Wagner. It's gonna yeah, it's depressing. It's also gonna take for fucking ever. Yeah, even the overtures. <laughs> and after that, you got your bread, right? Most of what we had, most of, mm, right? Most of what he had in the shop. Stuffed it in our bag and took it home. Kept us fed for maybe four or five days. I took another sip. Like soundless waves from an undersea earthquake, my sleepiness gave my boat a long, slow rocking. Of course, we accomplished our mission. We got the bread, but you couldn't say we had committed a crime. It was more of an exchange. We listened to Wagner with him, and in return, we got our bread. Legally speaking, it was more like a commercial transaction. But listening to Wagner is not work, she said. Girl, oh, you've never listened to Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, absolutely not. If the baker had insisted that we wash his dishes or clean his windows or something, well, we would have turned him down. But he didn't. All he wanted from us was to listen to his Wagner LP from beginning to end. Nobody could have anticipated that. I mean, <laughs> Wagner? <laughs> it was like the baker put a curse on us. <laughs> now that I think of it, we should have refused. We should have threatened him with our knives and taken the damn bread. Then there wouldn't have been any problem. You oh. had a problem? Uh-oh. I rubbed my eyes again. Sort of. Nothing you could put your finger on, but things started to change after that. It was kind of a turning point. Like, like I went back to the university, and I graduated, and I started working for the firm and studying for the bar exam, and I met you and got married. I never did anything like that before. No more bakery attacks. That's it? Yep. That's all there was to it. I drank the last of the beer. Now all six cans were gone. Six pull tabs lay in the ashtray like scales from a mermaid. Okay, wait. So listening to Wagner makes you successful. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. It sounds like listening to Wagner makes you driven to be a better human and more responsible and not randomly attack small business owners. <laughs> hmm. Wagner should be outlawed. <laughs> Or I'm going to start listening to Wagner. <laughs> I don't want to go back to school. I've had enough school. Of course, it wasn't true that nothing had happened as a result of the bakery attack. There were plenty of things that you could easily have put your finger on, but I didn't want to talk about them with her. Rude. He's like, we just got married. I'll tell you this later when we're old. He's just trying to keep some of the mystery alive. That's yeah, all. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're, it's still, they're still fresh. They're still fresh and, fresh and so clean, clean. So this friend of yours, what's he doing now? I have no idea. Something happened, some nothing kind of thing, and we stopped hanging around together. I haven't seen him since. I don't know what he's doing. For a while, she didn't speak. She probably sensed that I wasn't telling her the whole story, but she wasn't ready to press me on it. Still, she said, that's why you two broke up, isn't it? The bakery attack was the direct cause. Maybe so. I guess it was more intense than either of us realized. We talked about the relationship of bread to Wagner for days after that. We kept asking ourselves if we had made the right choice. We couldn't decide. And of course, if you look at it sensibly, we did make the right choice. Nobody got hurt. Everybody got what he wanted. The baker, 
I still can't figure out why he did what he did. But anyway, he succeeded with his Wagner propaganda. <laughs> and we succeeded in stuffing our faces with bread. Win-win. But even so, we had this feeling that we had made a terrible mistake. And somehow this mistake has just stayed there, unresolved, casting a dark shadow on our lives. That's why I use the word curse. It's true. It was like a curse. I mean, I feel the same after I see Wagner's. <laughs> <laughs> Wagner's going to come haunt me tonight. <laughs> hey, I listen. saw the ring cycle at the Met, and it was like eight hours long, and I fell asleep four times. <laughs> like, oh, oh. It's long. Fell asleep during Wagner. That's actually pretty tricky. It's usually abrasive enough to keep its listeners awake. Oh, honey. <laughs> hey, listener, here's a challenge for you. Sometime in the next week, just start playing Wagner kind of really low in public and see if you can upset people. <laughs> like while you're walking down the street, have Wagner playing out of your phone in your back yeah. pocket or something and just see how people respond. Just the overtures, though. It's going to be the overture of something. So, Do you think you still have it? The curse. The curse, yes. Yeah. Do you think you still have it? I took the six pull tabs from the ashtray and arranged them into an aluminum ring the size of a bracelet. Who knows? I don't know. I bet the world is full of curses. It's hard to tell which curse makes any one thing go wrong. That's not true, she looked right at me. You can tell if you think about it. And unless you yourself personally break the curse, it'll stick with you like a toothache. It'll torture you till you die. And not just you. Me too. Yeah, bitch, you roped me into this curse now. You didn't tell me this before the wedding. I agreed to, for better or worse, for richer or poor. I didn't agree to no fucking Wagner curse. I didn't agree to the Wagner bread curse. <laughs> the Wagnerian curse. The Va- that's, that, that, that's the title of this episode, yep. I think. You? Well, I'm your best friend now, aren't I? Why do you think we're both so hungry? hmm? I never, ever, once in my life felt a hunger like this until I married you. Don't you think it's abnormal? Your curse is working on me, too. (laughs) I nodded. Then I broke up the ring of pull tabs and put them back in the ashtray. I didn't know if she was right, but I did feel she was on to something. Mm-hmm. The feeling of starvation was back, stronger than ever. And your narrator's stomach just rumbled yeah. like a motherfucker. I just, I'm getting I very hungry. So hungry. I'm getting very hungry listening to this, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I think we've all been Wagner cursed. I'm <laughs> sorry, everyone at home. We'll put a we'll put a trigger warning on this one of you may extreme you may experience extreme hunger pangs and need to listen to very sad German opera. Sharp-eared listeners may notice that there has been (laughs) low-level Wagner playing underneath much of this episode. (laughs) The feeling of starvation was back stronger than ever and it was giving me a deep headache. Every twinge of my stomach was being transmitted to the core of my head by a clutch cable, as if my insides were equipped with all kinds of complicated machinery. I took another look at my undersea volcano. The water was even clearer than before, Is that a much euphemism clearer. For his penis? <laughs> <laughs> I took another look at my undersea volcano. <laughs> I mean, (laughs) it's not not his penis. Yeah, I feel like it's, I feel like the volcano is more of a, um, uh, a euphemism for sexual activity and less a, a specific phallic stand in. Okay, that's fair. I think it was the way you read it. It's like, I took another look at my undersea volcano. (laughs) Sounded like something fucking Matthew McConaughey would say. Something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey! I took another look at my undersea volcano. <laughs> that was not a good Matthew. That, that McConaughey. was not a great Matthew McConaughey. I wasn't going to say it. But uh, y- y- y'all heard it. Y'all heard it. <laughs> the water was even clearer than before, much clearer. Unless you look closely, you might not even notice it was there. 
It felt as though the boat were floating in mid-air with absolutely nothing to support it. I could see every little pebble on the bottom. All I had to do was reach out and touch them. We've only been living together for two weeks, she said, but all this time I've been feeling some kind of weird presence. She looked directly into my eyes and brought her hands together on the tabletop, her fingers interlocking. Of course, I didn't know it was a curse until now. This explains everything. You're under a curse. (laughs) What kind of presence? Like there's this heavy, dusty curtain that hasn't been washed for years hanging down from the ceiling. Maybe it's not a curse. Maybe it's just me, I said, and smiled. She did not smile. (laughs) No, it's not you, she said. Okay, suppose you're right. Suppose it is a curse. What can I do about it? Attack another bakery right away. Now, it's the only way. Oh my god. Now? Yes, now, while you're still hungry. You have to finish what you left unfinished. But it's the middle of the night. Would a bakery be open now? We'll find one. Tokyo's a big city. There must be at least one all-night bakery. I love that she's like, no, I'm not going to go to the all-night diner on the highway. But we going to rob a motherfucking bakery. That's for real. (laughs) That's acceptable. Sure. I love it. (laughs) We got into my old Corolla and started drifting around the streets of Tokyo at 2.30 a.m. Tokyo for Drift? A- <laughs> <laughs> Fast and the Furious? Fast and the Furious bread. Corolla style. <laughs> the, yeast the yeast and the... And the carbonated? Mm. The, the yeast and the... Uh, and the um, the yeast and the sourdough. <laughs> the, yeast. the yeast and the flour dust. <laughs> the yeast and the flour dough. <laughs> the yeast and the. Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift 2. The attack on the bakery. The attack of the bakery. <laughs> <laughs> We got into my old Corolla and started drifting around the streets of Tokyo at 2.30 a.m. looking for a bakery. There we were, me clutching the steering wheel, she in the navigator's seat, the two of us scanning the street like hungry eagles in search of prey. Stretched out on the back seat, long and stiff as a dead fish, was a Remington automatic shotgun. Whoa, fuck! This just got real intense! That escalated very quickly. Holy shit! (laughs) Full-on Bonnie and Clyde motherfuckery right here. Jesus. Jesus. Its shells rustled dryly in the pocket of my wife's windbreaker. We had two black ski masks in the glove compartment. Jesus! Why my wife owned a shotgun, I had no idea. Or ski masks. Neither of us had ever skied, but she didn't explain and I didn't ask. Married life is weird, I felt. Oh my god, his wife's a fucking criminal. Wow. Holy balls, that paragraph took a turn that I was not prepared for. (laughs) Wow. That just got dark so fast. (laughs) Dude, like you didn't check to see if your wife had mob connections before. Maybe it was an arranged marriage or some shit. Still. (laughs) Maybe she's the daughter of the guy that they robbed before. Ooh. Huh. Impeccably equipped, we were nevertheless unable to find an all-night bakery. I drove through all the empty streets, from Yoyogi to Shinjuku, on the Yatsuya and Akasaka, Aoyama, Hiru, Ropongi, Daikanyama, and Shibuya. That was payback for all the times I've had to do French. <laughs> <laughs> Um, with my sincerest apologies for all of those words that I mispronounced. (laughs) Late night Tokyo had all kinds of people and shops, but no bakeries. Not cool. Not cool, Tokyo. Twice we encountered patrol cars. 
One was huddled at the side of the road, trying to look inconspicuous. The other slowly overtook us and crept past, finally moving off into the distance. Both times, I grew damp under the arms, but my wife's concentration never faltered. She was looking for that bakery. Every time she shifted the angle of her body, the shotgun shells in her pocket rustled like buckwheat husks in an old-fashioned pillow. (laughs) Wow. Let's forget it, I said. There aren't any bakeries open this time of night. You've got to plan for this kind of thing or else... Stop the car! I slammed on the brakes. This is the place, she said. The shops along the street had their shutters rolled down, forming dark, silent walls on either side. A barbershop sign hung in the dark like a twisted, chilling glass eye. There was a bright McDonald's hamburger sign some 200 yards ahead, but nothing else. I don't see a bakery, I said. Without a word, she opened the glove compartment and pulled out a roll of cloth-backed tape. Holding this, she stepped out of the car. I got out my side. Kneeling at the front end, she tore off a length of tape and covered the numbers on the license plate. Then she went around to the back and did the same. She's done this before. (laughs) There was a practiced efficiency to her movements. I stood on the curb, staring at her. We're going to take that McDonald's, she said, (laughs) as coolly as if she were announcing what we would have for dinner. McDonald's is not a bakery, I pointed out to her. It's like a bakery, she said. Sometimes you have to compromise. Let's go. Oh my God, these people are about to fucking heist a McDonald's. Yep, it's one way to break a curse. (laughs) I drove to the McDonald's and I kind of wish we'd done this last week since Ronald McDonald was clown corner. Oh yeah! I drove to McDonald's. So we're doing two weeks in a row. So McDonald's got to sponsor us now. Yep, Come on. That's how it works. I guess that depends on how this story ends. <laughs> <laughs> I drove to the McDonald's and parked in the lot. And she handed me the blanket wrapped shotgun. I've never fired a gun in my life, I protested. You don't have to fire it. Just hold it, okay? Do as I say. We walk right in, and as soon as they say welcome to McDonald's, we <laughs> slip on our masks. Got that? Sure, but then you shove the gun in their faces and make all the workers and customers get together. Fast. I'll do the rest. But how many hamburgers do you think we'll need? 30? Holy shit! Uh, I, I guess so. With a sigh, I took the shotgun and rolled, and rolled back the blanket a little. The thing was as heavy as a sandbag and as black as a dark night. Do we really have to do this? I asked half to her and half to myself. Of course we do! Jesus Christ. Wearing a McDonald's hat, the girl behind the counter flashed me a McDonald's smile and said, (laughs) Welcome to McDonald's. I hadn't thought that girls would work at McDonald's late at night, so the sight of her confused me for a second, but only for a second. I caught myself and pulled on the mask. Confronted with this suddenly masked duo, the girl gaped at us. Obviously, the McDonald's hospitality manual said nothing about how to deal with a situation like this. She had been starting to form the phrase that comes after, Welcome to McDonald's, but her mouth seemed to stiffen and the words couldn't come out. Even so, like a crescent moon in the dawn sky, the hint of a professional smile lingered at the edge of her lips. (laughs) As quickly as I could manage, I unwrapped the shotgun and aimed it in the direction of the tables. But the only customers there were a young couple, students probably, and they were face down on the plastic table, sound asleep. Their two heads and two strawberry milkshake cups were aligned on the table like an avant-garde sculpture. (laughs) They slept the sleep of the dead. They didn't look likely to obstruct our operation, so I swung my shotgun back toward the counter. Altogether, there were three McDonald's workers. The girl at the counter, the manager, a guy with a pale egg-shaped face, probably in his late 20s, and a student type in the kitchen, a thin shadow of a guy with nothing on his face that you could read as an expression. They stood together behind the register, staring at the muzzle of my shotgun like tourists peering down an Incan well. No one screamed, and no one made a threatening move. 
The gun was so heavy, I had to rest the barrel on top of the cash register, my finger on the trigger. I'll give you the money, said the manager, his voice hoarse. They uh, collected it at 11, so we don't have too much, but you can have everything. We're insured. Lower the front shutter and turn off the sign, said my wife. Wait a minute, said the manager. I I can't do that. I'll be held responsible if I close up without permission. My wife repeated her order, slowly. He seemed torn. You'd better do what she says, I warned him. (laughs) It's like, I'm not sure what this bitch is capable of. He looked at the muzzle of the gun atop the register, then at my wife, and then back at the gun. He finally resigned himself to the inevitable. He turned off the sign and hit a switch on an electrical panel that lowered the shutter. I kept my eye on him, worried that he might hit a burglar alarm, but apparently McDonald's didn't have burglar alarms. (laughs) Maybe it had never occurred to anybody to attack one. Yeah, they have a dollar menu. You don't have to attack McDonald's. Nope. (laughs) The front shutter made a huge racket when it closed, like an empty bucket being smashed with a baseball bat, but the couple sleeping at their table was still out cold. Talk about sound sleep. I hadn't seen anything like that in years. (laughs) 30 Big Macs for takeout, said my wife. Uh, Let me just give you the money, pleaded the manager. I'll give you more than you need. You can buy food somewhere else. This is going to mess up my accounts and... You'd better do what she says, I said again. The three of them went into the kitchen area together and started making the 30 Big Macs. The student grilled the burgers. The manager put them in buns. The girl wrapped them up. Nobody said a word. I leaned against the big refrigerator, aiming the gun toward the griddle. The meat patties were lined up on the griddle like brown polka dots sizzling. The sweet smell of grilling meat burrowed into every pore of my body like a swarm of microscopic bugs dissolving into my blood and circulating to the farthest corners, then massing together inside my hermetically sealed hunger cavern, clinging to its pink walls. Holy shit, that was descriptive. (laughs) A pile of white-wrapped burgers was growing nearby. I wanted to grab and tear into them, but I could not be certain that such an act would be consistent with our objective. I had to wait. In the hot kitchen area, I started sweating under my ski mask. The McDonald's people sneaked glances at the muzzle of the shotgun. I scratched my ears with the little finger of my left hand. My ears always get itchy when I'm nervous. Jabbing my finger into the ear through the wool, I was making the gun barrel wobble up and down, which seemed to bother them. It couldn't have gone off accidentally because I had the safety on, but they didn't know that and I wasn't about to tell them. My wife counted the finished hamburgers and put them into two shopping bags, 15 burgers to a bag. Why do you have to do this? The girl asked me. Why don't you just take the money and buy something you like? What's the good of eating 30 Big Macs? That's a good question. I shook my head. My wife explained, We're really sorry, but there weren't any bakeries open. If there had been, we would have attacked a bakery. That (laughs) seemed to satisfy them. (laughs) At least they didn't ask any more questions. They were like, okay, these people just be fucking crazy. Okay, cool. Then my wife ordered two large Cokes from the girl and paid for them. Wait, what? (laughs) We're stealing bread, nothing else, she said. The girl responded with a complicated head movement, sort of like nodding and sort of like shaking. She was probably trying to do both at the same time. I thought I had some idea how she felt. My wife then pulled a ball of twine from her pocket... She came equipped and tied the three to a post as expertly as if she were sewing on buttons. She asked if the cord hurt or if anyone wanted to go to the toilet, but no one said a word. I wrapped the gun in the blanket. She picked up the shopping bags and out we went. The customers at the table were still asleep like a couple of deep sea fish. What would it have taken to rouse them from a sleep so deep? 
We drove for a half hour, found an empty parking lot by a building, and pulled in. There, we ate hamburgers and drank our Cokes. I sent six Big Macs down to the cavern of my stomach, and she ate four. Holy shit. That left 20 Big Macs in the back seat. Our hunger, that hunger that felt as if it could go on forever, vanished as the dawn was breaking. The first light of the sun dyed the building's filthy walls purple and made the giant Sony Beta ad tower glow with painful intensity. Soon the whine of highway truck tires was joined by the chirping of birds. The American Armed Forces radio was playing cowboy music. We shared a cigarette. Afterward, she rested her head on my shoulder. Still, was it really necessary for us to do this? I asked. Of course it was. With one deep sigh, she fell asleep against me. She felt as soft, as light, as a kitten. Alone now, I leaned over the edge of my boat and looked down to the bottom of the sea. The volcano was gone. The water's calm surface reflected the blue of the sky. Little waves, like silk pajamas fluttering in a breeze, lapped against the side of the boat. There was nothing else. I stretched out in the bottom of the boat and closed my eyes, waiting for the rising tide to carry me where I belonged. The End What the fuck was that? (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that took some very unexpected turns. Yeah, that was a weird one. Uh, Like beautiful writing and like the now be to be fair that like was translated but um i was not expecting it to go full bonnie and clyde white trash yeah (laughs) that was weird like the mcdonald's that's fucking hilarious it's great well i love that she paid for the two cokes like she's like we're just taking bread yeah (laughs) i wonder if it would have worked out just as well if they had just said Give, give me all your buns. Give me, <laughs> that sounds nasty. <laughs> give me all your buns toasted. Oh, no. They should have taken the little apple pies. I know. Those things are yummy. And those I are want like a bakery. Pie. Those are like bakeries. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have apple pies in the 80s. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Like, when did McDonald's? Well, and in Tokyo, they would have had a different menu than in America. Because McDonald's in different countries have different food. Because the McDonald's in America has fake food and <laughs> every other place has real meat. 1968. Oh, well then shit. But maybe they didn't have them in Tokyo. Maybe there uh, wasn't a... Yeah. Because apple pie is such an American thing. Hmm. It was the first dessert added to the McDonald's menu, actually, oh. was that little apple pie. It was before the ice cream machine that never yeah. works? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was cool. I really like that story. I really like that story. I'm like, I'm like, wow, that is not where I thought it was going. Also, I think they need to have a conversation about the wife's past. Yeah, I'm curious what her deal is. She was a little, little too comfortable with all of the breaking of the laws. Yeah, clearly really good at that. Owns a gun, knows how to black out her uh, license plates. Um, and she's a secretary at some kind of school. I'm like, okay, (laughs) maybe that's her cover. Oh, yeah. She is not a secretary at some school. She's she's like a a super spy or something. There's going to be a Mr. and Mrs. Smith situation happening here. Oh, that's what it is. She works for the Japanese government, secret agent. Yeah, super spy. And she goes, oh, I know how to fucking do this. Get me some fucking Big Macs. She's Japanese black ops. Yes. Uh, yeah. Tokyo drifting in our Corolla with the Big Max. Yo, yo, yo! <laughs> uh, so, hey, listener, what'd you think of that one? I thought Did that was fun. Enjoy it? Are you going to go find the, was it Kirsten Dunst? Yeah, there's a movie version of this, like, done by an indie, uh, indie film person, uh, and Kirsten Dunst is the wife, uh... 
Yeah, so um, hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, write in, let us know what you thought. Um, uh, if you decide to watch the short film, uh, let us know what you thought of that too. Yeah. I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on um that particular adaptation. And when you write in, either to fifty fifty arts production at gmail dot com or any of our social medias, which you can find by searching for Campfire Classics Podcast on Facebook and Instagram and all those other doobly schmucks. Um. <laughs> Please include uh, this year's, this year's, please include this week's secret passcode, which is Tokyo Drift. Tokyo Drift, Big Mac style. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's all I have. I'm really hungry and want to go rob a McDonald's. Do you have anything else? Let's go rob a McDonald's. All right. Uh, So until next week, when we hopefully will not be in prison for robbing McDonald's, this has been Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. This is when I really wish I knew the song that used to play in Ronald McDonald commercials. (laughs) Like, (laughs) come on down to be.